welcome to the ADHD Women's Wellbeing Podcast. I'm Kate Moore Youssef, your host, and if you've arrived here, there must be a reason. I'm guessing you're curious to learn more about improving your wellbeing alongside ADHD, or maybe looking for some advice or guidance to feel healthier and calmer. So, why start this podcast? I'm a wellbeing and lifestyle coach, EFT practitioner, mum to four kids, and I discovered my own ADHD alongside one of my daughters at the age of 40. And now, after supporting many other women just like me, and probably you, I feel there's a need for more emphasis on well-being and lifestyle help for women with ADHD. And through the podcast, I want to offer you new insights and perspectives to enable you to live your most fulfilled, calm and balanced life. So wherever you are on your ADHD journey, my aim is to support you in finding the awareness and the most aligned tools to enhance your well-being so you can make the most intentional mindset and lifestyle choices moving forwards. Ready to get started? Here's the episode. So hello, welcome back to the ADHD Women's Wellbeing Podcast. And um, This week I have something that I've been really looking forward to chatting about um, and it's all about yoga and breath work. And I have got a fantastic expert and specialist here. Her name is Jane Nichols and she is the creator of Freestyle Fitness Yoga. She's been in this industry for about 30 years and she is an educator and yoga and fitness presenter and she is a breathwork expert. So all the things that I want to talk about in this week's podcast. So Jane, welcome to this week's episode. I'm really looking forward to chatting because I know how powerful using our breath is. I don't even want to use it breath work because then it makes it sound, makes it sound more complicated than it is. I just know that using our breath on a daily basis can be so beneficial for all of us, but especially for us with ADHD. So welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm so looking forward to it. I feel this surge of adrenaline that I've got 101 things to say. And where do we start? Where? Yeah, exactly. Where do we start? I mean, maybe we can just go right back to 30 years of, I guess, what drew you to this industry you know, 30 years ago, there was no such thing as social media and yeah. this huge industry of health and fitness and yoga and it being like a trendy thing to do didn't exist. Yeah. So there must have been something intrinsically that drew you to wanting to work in this industry. What was it? Uh-huh. It was probably a succession of failures, actually, because I did a degree, as most people, it was very easy then to do your degree. I was funded to do it in dance and English which was amazing, but it doesn't necessarily qualify you to do that many things. So my intention, I wanted to be a journalist or a dancer, and I wasn't good enough to be a dancer. So when I left university, my friend who did a sports science degree got a job at a gym. I went to the gym and got immediately immersed in it. It was very easy, very attainable. Exercise to music was relatively new. And remember, we were in the days of John Travolta and Jamie Lee Curtis in Perfect. It was that kind of thing. It was the thong leotards. I got absolutely thrust into exercise to music. My dance background, my love of music, moving to music to me is a joy. It's meditation. It's a gift. So I started on that journey. And at the same time, People came over from Australia and started to turn exercise to music into a career, not a hobby. And I was just on the forefront of it. So we became fitness presenters. I was sponsored by Nike from a very early age. And nothing was unachievable. No matter what we wanted to do, we were just cherry picking, taking things, trying it, running with it. And it was amazing. So for about 10 years... I was a fitness presenter. I had a partnership, a company, and we used to go on tour twice a year, giving new ideas to fitness instructors. And then in the year 2000, Pilates came into our industry and kind of dragged yoga, kicking and screaming. We just picked it up. I'm going to do yoga today. I'm going to go on tour and I'm going to teach people yoga. And it tapped me back into my dance days. And it was overwhelming for me. So what I did, I went into it as um, a fitness professional and I just took it, stole it and ran with it, which 
the yoga people just despised and just couldn't deal with. But as a formative process in learning, it was just the very best way to enter yoga. And it just took a hold of me. Then I was age 30. I'm now 56. So I've had 26 years now to get better at it every day of my life, which is what I have done. And I've, I've not taken the education and done it that way. I've taught and then took the education. And for me, this is these are the things I will pass on to you guys today. Just take it and run with it. Mm. Yeah, I love it because it's such an, a different way from coming at, you know, coming at it. And I love this sort of mentality of just honing in on what makes you thrive, like that passion and just, you know, not having to ask permission of anyone, just doing it your way and, once, yeah. you know, and, and creating something that's quite innovative that works for you and that you know that you can teach. And obviously you got a sense that there was something there, that you were onto something. And, you know, we all know how big yoga has become. But, I mean, we were just talking about it before we started recording, that there is this other element. I think it's probably whether it's you don't feel like you're worthy of being part of that kind of crew. And especially I know that a lot of listeners here perhaps might not fall into that typical yoga or mindful or exercise person but are curious and interested to know how they can use this to help improve their lifestyle and their well-being especially because this is what this podcast is about you know I know for a fact as a woman with ADHD that movement exercise breath work meditation all of these things combined with music combined with I guess someone that you connect with you have to really connect with that instructor is pivotal for our, especially I'd say it's pivotal for my well-being. So which part of that for you has kept you going? You know, you're 56 now, which is the bit? Is it the music? Is it the breath work? Is it the movement? What keeps it fresh for you every day? It is the passion for it. It's the passion to learn and know more, but not be told. Do you know, when I entered yoga, there was vitriol from the yoga side, you know, because I didn't do it in the way that a typical yoga teacher would do it, kind of stole it. To be honest, at the age I am now, even at 40, probably, I would not have stolen yoga. The more I learned about it, the less inclined I would have been to do it my route, which is why I'll always hang on to that as the best learning journey. The roller coaster of being bad and learning is amazing, whereas the plateau of being good at it is actually quite dull and it doesn't give me the buzz. It doesn't give me the impetus. So I crave slaps in the face and I crave being wrong all the time. I want, I want to be made right. So it is that incentive every day to be better and know more and implement. I am a re reluctant yogi. So at the very beginning, one thing I learned is when all of the yoga industry, and in fact, my industry said, no, you can't do this. This is not yoga. I used to get really upset and really angry. And that's because they were right. And what I've learned now is I immersed myself when social media came out. I immersed myself on the yoga sites and experienced really negative feedback. And I learned then that if you go to bed with whatever's leveled at you, telling you that you can't and that you're wrong, that if you wake up in the morning and it's an irritation, they're right, and you have to deal with that. But if you wake up in the morning with a clear head and an easy conscience, you know that you're on the right path. And that's been a great way to keep me motivated and going. And I, I love the roller coaster. I got hooked on it very early. And that's part of being a businesswoman as well. Mm -hmm. you know, I've made a huge success out of the fitness industry, which not many people did. And, you know, I want to pass that on. I want people to know that you can be a successful businesswoman and a yogi. They're not, one mm. doesn't cancel the other out. Yeah. I mean, what I'm hearing is there's a slight rebellion there. There's a bit of a rebellious nature of, like you're saying, mixing things up and doing it your way. And unless you've done something bad and you wake up with a guilty conscience or you feel, you know, that it's not right, you just keep going with your gut. And that takes, you know, a lot of inner strength. It takes courage. 
and it's exciting. I like the way that you talk to me about these the dips and you thrive off the unknown maybe and you thrive off that kind of rush of where's this going to take me? It's a very ADHD trait that to have this rebellious nature of wanting to do it your way and knowing that you can see something that other people can't see because we are told from a very young age we're sort of conditioned aren't we to to kind of do things the right way and the, that fits the right box and follow the pattern that everyone else is doing yeah. but it's when we take those detours that's when lots of failures can happen but very often that one of those detours is going to end up in success and that's what I, I can see that's happened with you yeah and it's through adherence and that's one of the points that I will put to you and we are victims as well of the society that we grow up on. It goes in cycles, doesn't it? And I find that at the moment, you know, we're told you must do breath work because it will help you. You must do yoga because it's the in thing and it's just going to change your life. But as soon as we do it, we're told, no, you're doing it wrong. Or no, you can't go any further. And I find this contrary nature of society at the moment somewhat frustrating. I think it comes from being just under five foot tall that makes you chippy. <laughs> and I've always had that chippy nature. I always like a fight. I do. Not a fist fight, but an intellectual fight. It keeps me going. And um, I've learned to temper that. And all of the things I'm going to pass on to you today will hopefully, in that same way, help. I know that I'm divine. It's a beautiful word, isn't it? And yoga and fitness and understanding all of the things have helped me to understand my divinity. And within that divinity, I'm no longer, I don't get imposter syndrome, which dogs all of us. And I think people with ADHD, from what I've learned, and you must always tell me no, Jane, can suffer with imposter syndrome a lot. Mm. And it's debilitating. And these things that I'm going to talk about today will help us empower ourselves to get over or get through the titles that people, or we, worse, we put upon ourselves on a daily basis. Mm. So, I mean, what you're saying there is divinity, divine, and, and what I can feel is that you have self-belief. And that self-belief helps move you forwards through the, the successes and the failures, and it just keeps you going. There's a resilience. Do you know what? Let's just get into the breath work because we suffer very much with emotional dysregulation with ADHD. A lot of people think that one of the main issues with ADHD is focus and concentration. And that can be really challenging. But actually, from a lot of the work that I do with, with women, especially, it's the emotional regulation, it's the moods, it, it's just feeling even and balanced is probably the most challenging part of everyone's day. And then we've got hormones thrown in as well. So we've got that extra layer at different times of the month. So I would say for me, breath work has 100% helped me when I feel like I'm on the edge, when I feel like I've woken up and I'm already overwhelmed just by looking at my diary, when I know that my kids want me in all different directions and I'm trying to run a business and I'm trying to be a good wife and I don't know what else to do apart from just go five ten minutes and go and breathe and that for me is just that constant daily thing that I know that if I forget to breathe I feel like my jaws clench my shoulders are up to my ears I'm not very nice to be around and I wish I'd known about breath work 20 odd years ago because I'm not doing breath work sitting with my eyes closed and cross-legged in a dark room surrounded by crystals, even though that sounds and is very nice. I'm doing breath work when I'm emptying the dishwasher. Yes. I'm, do I'm doing it when I'm walking the dog. I'm doing it in the car on the way to pick up the children from school. And that is when I'm doing my breath work. So it's not luxurious and it's not the typical holistic way of doing it but I'm doing it to fit my life and this is what I wanted to talk to you about today and let's just go straight in to what where would you recommend people to do their breath work when how how does it look like to you well you've completely summed up my first three points so <laughs> sorry <laughs> anyway let's move on <laughs> point number one and and you have done this is to notice the breath that's notice your breath Notice the breath of other people. Notice how breath changes 
constantly throughout the day with the different moods, with the way that we're feeling, with the way that other people impact us. When, when a phone rings, when the dog barks, when the child cries, how does your breath change? So I'll give you an example is you're standing in a queue at the post office and you become aware of this, this short, sharp out breath. People, because they're frustrated and they're queuing or you, the time everything gets disaligned is the breath changes. And when we're aggravated, it becomes extremely clipped, extremely short and extremely imbalanced. We tend to breathe out, but we don't breathe in. And that's when we start to hear words like hyperventilation. And we get all of the um, results of a, even a moderate hyperventilation, which are fatigue, anxiety, frustration, tiredness, all of the things that will stop us doing what we want to do in a day. So if we suddenly start to notice the breath, we can then plan a course of action that will change this mild hyperventilation because short, short breaths are great. So example, if you get up in the morning, you can't wake up and you want to um, get yourself moving. The short, sharp breath is fantastic because it's that breath, not only of anxiety, but it's the breath of pleasure, of elation. You know, when you're in the realm, the throes of amazing passion, you don't want to suddenly take a long, deep breath and calm yourself down, do you? You want to run with it. So if we can learn to notice it and then learn to use it as a superpower to its best advantage. So you're saying short, short breath. Can you just give us an example? And is this something that will energize people? So if you are feeling sluggish or you, you know, you need a shot of energy, you need to finish your last bit of work before you go and pick the kids up or you've got on a deadline. Is this the type of thing that you'd energize yourself with? Yeah. So do this with me as I speak to you. Just touch your collarbones, your clavicle. So that's what I'm calling short, sharp breath. And it's the breath that you and I will use now because we're talking. And that's why we can become so depleted after sessions like this. I mean, this will only last an hour. But if you're teaching for hours on end, the day after you do that, you can feel so lethargic. So the short, sharp breath can energize you but what we need to do to that breath is make it aligned make it even on the in breath and the out breath whereas the fatiguing over excited breath can be unaligned so it's all out and no in mm -hmm. so if i were to feel sluggish what i might do is take a two count in breath and a two count out breath Just for a short amount of time, this is not something we do for a long amount of time, sit back and see how I feel. Mm. And that was through your nose, wasn't it? Yes. Both, it yeah. um, we will come up, this is a massive part of how we do it. Yeah. But right now, point one is to notice. Notice how you feel. Notice what breaths are like. When you're asleep or when you're watching the TV or when you're amazingly content, notice your breath will lengthen naturally. Yeah, yeah. Notice when you're in pain, what does your breath do? Notice all of these times. And notice is one of those skills in life that we don't do. Once you start to notice the breath, you start to notice the color of the sky, juxtaposed with the color of the trees, with the color of petals. If we can notice more, it's a great skill to have because it links to empathy. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, noticing and awareness is just, again, I always sort of say the same as the awareness is just a gift. Even if you can't do anything else, it's just when we have that awareness and noticing, especially with our breath. So you just said about the equal breath in. So is that kind of like a box breath? Very often I do the, the box breathing where it's four, 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 four. Can you explain a little bit about that type of breath work and yeah I mean I personally think it's so easy because it's so easy to remember so it's one of those things I always t tell my clients because you just can't mess that one up and you can always remember it and you can't mess let's take this even further you know we have this gift of breathing okay and it doesn't matter who we are how successful we are what's right with us wrong with us that's one thing that unites us all we breathe and we know we're doing it because we're alive. And if we don't do it, we're dead. And it doesn't matter. 
the quality of that breath is just so super, super important. So I think what you refer to as a Brox breath is probably not in my um, in my dialogue, in my narrative, but I'm presuming it is what I would call alignment of the breath, where evenly matched in to out. And yeah. what we would aim for is, for example, the two count breath is relatively short. The norm is a four count breath in to out, which for me is acceptable exceptionally short then we'd move it to six and six eight and eight all the way up to breathing in for a minute and out for a minute if you can master mm. that mm. yeah so the box breathing is where you breathe in say for four seconds you hold for four seconds you breathe out through your nose for four seconds yeah. hold and breathe in again so it's there's the holding of the breath that yeah. is brought breath into retention. it. So I think what we should do is we talk about nasal breathing now, and then we talk about the different types of breath, which you would have the short breath, which is we call it a clavicular breath, a medium breath, which is a thoracic breath, a full breath, which is filling your lungs, and then there's breath retention. Once we've mastered those, we can do and achieve anything. So the first big question is, do we breathe through the mouth or do we breathe through the nose? And often we mislead you in fitness. They give you a bizarre breath to movement pattern that is not correct. If you do Pilates, often Pilates will tell you to breathe in through the nose and out through the mouth. I do not believe to be correct. Although I have studied Joseph Pilates in depth and I can never find where he is the master says that. It's been modernized. But in for health and for yoga, we generally breathe in through the nose and out through the nose. And the reason we do that is that there are many reasons to do it, to be honest. First of all, the orifice, and I can still not say that word without giggling. If you just look at the orifice space, the nose is very small and the mouth is huge. So to do one breathe in through the nose and out through the mouth is completely imbalanced because the speed, the cadence of it, the, the volume would be so different if it's going in through these two small channels and out through this massive channel. It simply cannot be balanced. But if we look at the formation of the nose, it's filled with little micro hairs. So that will filter the impurities mm -hmm. as they come in and going out, to be fair. If we look at the size of it, we can balance as we go in and we can balance as we come out if we use the same orifice. You've got this mucous membrane that warms the breath. So the lungs don't really welcome cold air. So it, it, it filters and it warms and it makes the breath much more conducive to the environment that it's entering. So if we're going to take the time to breathe through the nose, let's take the time to breathe back out through the nose. So for the purpose of a better breath practice, we'll cut out exhaling through the mouth. Yeah, that's really well explained. And would you say that nose breathing helps you feel calmer? Is better for sleep? Is it better for your nervous system? Well, it's interesting because the very first insight I had to breath work was by a guy called Bateko, Russian scientist. So look him up. And he he was around the 50s in the same time to Pilates, and they did great work on this kind of thing then. He believed that all disease was caused by hyperventilation. And, um, you know, obviously one of the key things when you sleep, you can't lie to yourself, you can't fake it. So naturally I know when I sleep, I breathe through my nose. Yet my partner who snores and has a certain degree of sleep apnea is breathing through his mouth. How we change that, I mean, they tape their mouths, which um, it, it can actually, I'm, I'm dubious about it. Obviously, because I don't have to do it, I don't do it. But, you know, it, let me just put on a caveat here. If you tape your mouth, you can't go using sellotape because it's covered in adhesive and it's really bad for you. But the other thing, if I put my hand over my mouth, I'm claustrophobic and it makes me panic. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, when you're 
in sleep, if your mouth's covered and you wake up, you could wake up panicking. Mm-hmm. So um, I think we do the groundwork whilst we're awake, yeah. and that should sympathetically transfer to when we're asleep. And if it doesn't, and apnea and snoring are a huge problem, then we need specialist help. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting because my partner as well is, is a snorer and I've discussed with him about the mouth taping and he's not interested. <laughs> so well, I, yeah, yeah. Not. I can spend half my time prodding him because yeah. he's snoring and then the other half prodding him because he's not moving. <laughs> you can't wait. <laughs> and then you're the one that wakes up exhausted. <laughs> Absolutely. Don't, don't start me on this. Yes. That's <laughs> I know, I'm the same. We'll, we'll talk about that off, off camera. Hi, everyone. I wanted to share with you a couple of updates, some news that I think um, you are entitled to know. So firstly, I wanted to share with you about my new workshop, which is all about managing your nervous system. Now, I'm really passionate about this because it crops up time and time again with all my clients and myself included, that as people with ADHD, especially with women, that we have a lot, there's a lot going on and our nervous system very regularly bears the brunt of this. So during this one hour workshop, I'll be discussing the different ways we can experience burnout and exhaustion. We can feel that dysregulation in our nervous system, what it feels like in our bodies. And I will be explaining how that correlates so much with ADHD. I'm going to be touching on the vagus nerve, the polyvagal theory, and generally what is our nervous system and how it can feel so overloaded and ways that we can manage that with daily choices, intentional practical tools that we can bring in so we can help ourselves feel calmer, more grounded, more balanced, and importantly, not sort of, you know, on the verge of burnout and exhaustion. And it's so important that we understand our nervous systems because this really helps us to protect our emotional well-being and it helps us make these intentional choices that we can wake up every day and recognise what is going to enhance and regulate our nervous system and what's going to deplete it. So this is going to be on the 12th of May. It's 2pm UK time. It's £33. All the details are on my website. If you head there now, it's coachingbykate.me.uk and you'll be able to just book straight away. And I really hope to see you at the workshop. Now back to the podcast. I totally am with you on the nose breathing and I do a type of yoga called kundalini yoga that has opened my eyes up to nose breathing and the power of of the breath and also just the breath retention and I love breath retention I don't know what it does to me can you tell me a little bit why I would maybe really benefit from it because what whenever I start doing it and whenever I do it it does something it washes something over me that I can't explain what's it doing Well, I think you probably um, warm to it because you most likely did it before. (laughs) We hold our breath an awful lot and it's like a comfort blanket for a lot of us. I mean, sometimes I think when we say we're good or an expert at something, what I was thinking when I was talking to you at the beginning, do I sound arrogant? And then I have to say, no, I'm allowed a certain arrogance here because I am hugely incompetent at so many other things so what runs parallel to me doing business now is I have a horse and I ride my horse every day and my desire is to be a better horsewoman but I'm so inept at it and when I have my horse lessons I'm so exhausted after because I hold my breath throughout the whole of it that is what I do as my go-to comfort and I'm powerful when I hold my breath what I've learned to do now is channel it for the greater good rather than do it as a mechanism where I'm stressed, I'm overwhelmed, I'm tired, I hold my breath. I have now learned to place breath retention in a much healthier breath cycle. So when you hold your breath, you're in absolute control. As long as you have a balance of oxygen in and CO2 out and you're not holding the breath at the end, So, for example, if you remember, go back to when you started practicing breath retention, you breathe in, you hold your breath and you kind of spluttering around. You hold it so much that you've just got to get rid of it. Well, what we very quickly become is really um, skilled at holding the breath, but not having that fear that we're going to die or we won't breathe. 
It's like divers very quickly become great at it and can hold their breath for a prolonged period of time. This is one of the amazing things about working on a breath practice is that you become good at it really quickly. It isn't mm. brain surgery and it isn't hard. So you like it, I think, because you can do it. And because <laughs> you can do it, you quickly see its benefit. Yeah, it's interesting. I know I hold my breath when I'm trying to concentrate. So when i am finally got time to sit and, and work um, without any distractions, and I know that I'm kind of like in a bit of hyper-focus mode, I know that I've got to write a social media post or I've got to write an email and I can feel it. It's literally like hold my breath, right, 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 and then release. But it's the holding of the breath is is tension, but it's helping me. It's giving me that, I don't know, that quick boost of energy or it's giving me that opportunity to focus. Um, I don't know, but I want to channel it more into more of a calming way as opposed to utilizing okay. it but unless it's helping me unless in that moment when I know that I've got that time to write that I just that's the way I use it but you know what Kate you've got to have the confidence to know that what you're doing is right because it works for you a you feel good with it b you like it and c you can do it so it works so I wouldn't question it or challenge it I would just focus on making it work even better like you say you want to be able to relax yourself now. It's a very different breath. Okay, so what does that look like? What's the, I've come out of that hyper-focus mode and I'm, I'm just going to talk about this as, I guess, because I think a lot of listeners will resonate that you come out of that mode of really using your brain power and then afterwards there is a depletion, this okay. mental exhaustion. Can I just m pick up on one thing that you said, which is mm. so important? So my basic tips were one, to notice, and then we went off piece, which I love, but you've just brought it back up because you said the words, when I give myself time, mm. which is something that you must along the way of doing your breath work and your mindfulness and your awareness, you must have learned to give yourself time. And, and it's something that you now take for granted but on the first steps to being meditative, whether it's a breath practice or a mind practice or a visualization practice, it is allowing yourself time. That time can be a minute, up to 10 minutes, up to an hour. It could be the listening of this podcast is your time. But you have to allow yourself the time to notice and be aware and make changes to the breath. And you're doing that. You've given yourself You've crossed that line. We're now on to the next. But for someone that doesn't use a breath practice, it's one of the hashtag top three recipes for success in a breath practice. So be aware and give yourself time. So what would be a calming breath work exercise when we can feel that our nervous system has been shot to pieces all day? You know, we've worked in it. We're working in an office. A lot of people wanting us. There's a lot of women out there who you know, have to mask their ADHD or they have to overcompensate and try and fit in with a day that is not conducive to feeling calm and balanced. Yeah. So how can we then harness our breath to well, you, come out of that place? My, you can see me fidgeting <laughs> because I'm so excited about this part. So I'm going to give you two different breaths, not necessarily just the calming breath, so we dealt with the clavicular. So now, as I say these words, I just want you to touch your ribs. And, and, and you need the sense of touch as well to really get into this. So the next phase of our breath work is the thoracic breath. And this one is super because it's the powerful breath. It can change you into a superhero. And it's often misunderstood. So when we think of breathing, it, the, 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 we can talk about the practical aspect of breathing in through the nose and out through the nose. But the two, the internal organ that we're using most are the lungs. And as the lungs sit, they come all the way through the rib cage, all the way down towards the pelvis. So we're now dealing with these lungs, the space of the lungs between the rib cage. Now, what you may not know, and I hope if you walk away from this, that I've told you at least one thing that you weren't aware of the majority of your lungs sits in the back of the body so often when you're eager to take a big breath in you will breathe in 
and the chest rises and your face gets strained and you feel it in your neck, it's indicative to me that your breath is still relatively shallow. So what I want you to train yourself to do now is that when you breathe, if you put your hands on the outsides of your rib cage, so your fingers are like ribs, they're right on the outside, so that when you breathe in, you learn the ability to expand yourself width ways. And you'll feel the ribs pushing into your hands. Now, because you do Kundalini yoga, which is the serpent, they, they, they chase the serpent energy coming up through the base of the spine, through the chakras, they should teach you to do that. But it's really difficult because what will happen, and it's great to do this with a partner, get someone to watch you from the back. If I ask you to breathe into the ribs, you breathe into the shoulders. And you can see it, you can see, almost visualize the breath coming in and it rebounds off the ribs and goes up into the shoulder. So we know it's taking something of a negative detour. We can see that happen if we do it with a partner. So it's repeat, repeat, repeat to get you to inflate. The way I like to visualize it, because all meditative processes involve visualization, it's the breath of the superhero. So if you pick a superhero, for me, it's Mighty Mouse. Whenever you see a picture, they're thoracically puffed up. It's like Charles Atlas. It's very, very masculine. Men tend to do this better because they don't have that imposter syndrome as we have. They take that breath, puff themselves up, and boom, off they go with that masculine energy. And we've got to learn to channel that. If you want empowerment and if you want... It can be quite relaxing, but empowerment can also relax us, not just the deep breath, which we'll go on to. So this breath, where it fills the rib cage, puffs us up. If you were to do an Ashtanga or a, a Vinyasa type class, it's what you would flow to. This yeah. is the breath practice that you would use to synchronize movement, focus, mind and breath. To me, it's the gift because I love meditation in movement whether that's yoga running swimming i i like to be moving meditating breathing focusing healing empowering and energizing all in one go yeah. so it's thoracic breath practice that's so very very important so but what you're saying is if we harness our breath more whether it's in dancing running swimming we will get a more mindful, more meditative practice, which will not just help our bodies, it's going to help our minds as well. Yes, because we align the mind, the mind, the body and the internal system learn to work together. Because when we get in stressed or, or we lose the ability to breathe well and lose the ability to function, it's a disconnect. There is no alignment between our internal selves. And that's all that these practices will give you. And it's lovely speaking to you because whether you credit yourself with having mastered it, the things that you're saying show to me that you are way up on this, this learning curve of being a better breather and being more in touch. So what I think we have to do is learn to give ourselves the credit for moving forward really quickly and give ourselves the pat on the back, rather than saying, I don't get it, I don't understand it, just keep trying new things. Yeah, and I think many of us with ADHD, when it starts getting super technical, and I'm not, I don't, I'm not gonna generalize here because some people are very sort of science-based and they love all the sort of technicalities, but maybe I'm sort of speaking for myself. When I'm told that you've got to pass all the technicalities, you've got to understand it all, I automatically shut off. But when I'm practically doing it in a way that works for me, I mean, what you're saying, you've kind of reinforced a few times, you've given me permission to do it my way. And I, God, I wish I'd heard that, you know, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, even recently, because when I wasn't given that permission to look at it the way I want to look at it and practice it how I want to, I've just, well, I can't, clearly I'm not cut out for that or I can't do that or I don't understand it. And then when you're giving me this permission to do the breath work and I can see the results. So it's working for me. And again, you know, whether how I'm 
swimming with my breath work maybe yes I could do with some lessons but if it's working for me and I think maybe what I want to say to anyone else that's listening is that even if you've not been taught it by an instructor but intuitively you know that you're harnessing breath work to, to help you you know whether it's to fall asleep at night emotional flooding I, I talked about emotional regulation but going from naught to 60 is this rush of anger, temper, impatience, intolerance, whatever you want to call it, is very, very common. So, which is why sometimes we get into trouble with our mouth because we just say things, you know, because there's not, the the connection's not there. And that's when I speak to a lot of my clients about bringing in breath work, because I do believe it, it can be accumulative. If you practice breath work and learning how to harness your breath every day, that emotional flooding happens a lot less. Is that something that you talk about where it can be an accumulative effect? Well, I think it's a trigger, isn't it? Because if you, on that split second before you fire, focus on your breath, then you dissipate the fire, don't you? But you're doing something that helps you. I mean, the breath really could be anything. Couldn't it? I always tell people who come on my courses when they say, when people come to yoga and they'll say, you know, I've been to my osteopath and he says that my back is so much better since I started doing yoga. You're amazing. I'm going to come every week. Don't believe them. They could be doing Scottish dancing and the effect would be the same. The fact that we're choosing on breath work to focus on here is because the ramifications are huge and it is probably the best way to distract yourself. But distraction techniques could be one of anything, couldn't they? We've just got to learn, and this is point three that you've just brought in, is to adhere to them, to, to take ownership of them and, and to make make whatever your distraction technique to work for you. You could choose no better distraction technique than breathing. And then there's other ones that we can add to that. But it could be other things. It's just learning to prioritize that technique Mm. over what intuitively would be your fire up or your kickstart or the emotion that is, is happening that you don't want to happen. Yeah. It's like a pause button, isn't it? Yes, it is. Exactly. Yeah. I'm an EFT practitioner. So I use tapping as my pause technique and I bring in breath work with that. So it's just tapping, breathing three rounds of breath work and EFT and that just brings down the cortisol in your body it brings down the nervous system that wants to fire up and just those three minutes so powerful just to know that you've got tools in your back pocket I think is empowering knowing that you just use your breath go into the toilet you know you're just about to you're about to have an argument with someone pause walk out the door do a few minutes of breath work. And I think it's very difficult to come back to that same level of anger when you've done a bit of breath work, when you've done those breathing exercises, because you just, you just had an, an opportunity to shift that perspective. Yeah, and, and switching the perspective is so important because if it's an argument-based, no matter who you're arguing with, you are half accountable for that argument. So the breath maybe take the other person out the equation and that you might have dissipated your anger towards that human being, whether it's it's warranted or not. But that pause allows you to look inside yourself and why do I want to argue with this person? What, what, what How am I accountable within this situation? And then breathing has become the, the tool that is used, the word tool that you use to be a better human being a more accountable human being and a more gifted human being in how you react and how your body functions. And I think we can ask for no better than that in our lives, really. Mm. We become in control of who we are and how we function. Yeah. Like what I think what you said when how we react, because we can be constantly in this reactive state, you know, constantly just ready and when we reclaim control and we know that we have it within us to maintain the calm and the balance despite other people I think that's the big thing isn't it when you start doing a bit of work on yourself you can't change all these other people around you 
and people are going to be surrounded by family members that are going to trigger them, colleagues, friends that don't get it, that just don't get you. But we, if we can maintain that sense of calm within us, and it can be so difficult, and I don't think you master it until the day that you die. I think it's just a constant thing, isn't it? Yeah, and you've just said something that's really interesting and is, and is a, I, I find this hard to do. So I'll speak to you today and I'll get away from this conversation and I'll be in a high because we resonate one another. But the people in my closest um, family unit just don't get it. And because it's me that's giving it or offering it to them, they don't get it even more for whatever reason. Um, and, and I found that ultimately frustrating. But, but I've learned to disassociate it, you know, to the people that are, I'm, I'm always going to be my mother's daughter and she'll treat me as a daughter and I'm, I'm my partner's girlfriend and he'll treat me as a girlfriend but he won't treat me as the expert that, that will allow him to change. And, and it is really frustrating because the people that we think need it, but the only person that needs this are us. Mm. Because once we have these tools, we can bear that, we can compartmentalize it and we can get our kicks and our warmth or our comfort or our intellectual stimulation, I hate to say it, in other places. Yeah. Yeah. That's really, really, I really resonate with that. And it is hard, isn't it, when you feel that you see people that you know that you could potentially help, but they're not interested. I'm super conscious that we only dealt with the thoracic breath and we didn't deal with the full breath. Okay, let's talk about this. Let's go there. This cannot end until (laughs) we've, you know, really tackled the calming breath. Let's do, uh, that's the most important. Let's get into the calming breath. So the calming breath is, is a full breath and it utilizes your lung in entirety. So you breathe in through your nose as we did, and now it's extended. So you're not trying to expand width ways. I think uh, for me as a quick tool, I think the best way to do it is breathing through the nose and immediately draw, visualize the base of the lung, visualize the pelvis and breathe down into the base of the lung, very much as if you were pouring some water, fluid, liquid into a glass. You know, it would fill from the bottom up, and that's what you're trying to do. And then you very smoothly, to the same amount of counts, so example, you're doing an eight count, and that's ongoing, you want to keep increasing, you breathe out for eight counts. But the important thing is, because this is where it can become you can start coughing and spluttering and feeling claustrophobic and angry. I remember it used to make me angry because you're gasping for air a little bit. This is where you need a reset button. So if that happens, you get off the wagon of breathing deeper and you just get about your day and do a couple of normal breaths. And then you start again, breathing. Mm. So we can bring this long breath we can even set an, a timer on our phone and just say three minutes of not even like two minutes of, of long breathing. Absolutely. Your Apple Watch will tell you to do it. It reminds yeah. you to do it if you've got an Apple Watch. It reminds you to breathe. But that's that's how simple it is. So the clavicular breath, the short breath, the energizing breath, let's call it two counts. The thoracic breath, the superhero breath mm-hmm. that will empower you, let's call it four counts. The deep breath, let's call it eight counts as a start off. And then your rhythm is your own thing. How you change that is up to you. We're looking for elongation in the breath. I'm gonna give you another super tip. And that is if you do yoga, you hear people breathing noisily. You sound a bit like Darth Vader. (laughs) It's the Vedic breath. It's described as a resonation of the glottis, which means nothing to me. How one would resonate their glottis and still don't understand it in yoga speak but basically you're just making a snoring noise it's this sounds like if you put a shell to your ear it's that kind of and the reason you're doing it and if you know the reason it's really easy is that you can hear yourself breathe and as a distraction technique it's amazing because you've brought in another sense Mm. not only now am I breathing 
but I brought in sound. And sound, as you move on, is so crucial to change. That's like in, in Kundalini, you probably have used the chiming bowls. The resonation of sound will take you to the ultimate level. Mm. But right now, another tool for you to use is hear your breath. So you can hear it start. You can hear it judder when you start to get a little bit off beast. And when you've got to the maximum in breath, you'll hear it stop. And then you make a noisy out breath. So you've completely immersed yourself in your own breath practice. Yeah. What about if we did a count of, say, eight in or six in, and then we did a longer breath out? That's when your breath retention comes. So it's easier to breathe out, I think. I think you'll find this as you pray. The people, you probably know this. But if you're new to it, it's a lot easier to control the breath out because when you breathe in, you're not used to filling your lungs. So you lift yourself up, as we discussed, and you you actively shut off the in-breath. Mm. So I've got a couple of tips that I want to give people for that, which is great. So when that happens, and it will happen, forget your count. Breathe in and do the breath retention that you spoke. So you'll breathe in. I'm all tense, I'm all anxious, I've contracted my neck muscles, I've contracted my chest muscles. Breathe in, hold the breath and just not let the breath go, but let the tension go. Give yourself a break, actively drop your arms, pause for a second and breathe in again because you've created that bit of space where the tension and the the blockage was. So think your mind, I'm going to breathe in for four, Hold my breath, relax, breathe in for two. And then breathe out. So you're going uphill when you breathe in. You're just taking that breather because it's harder. Mm. And that's where the breath retention becomes invaluable. So you'll do it in stages. First off, breathe in for four, breathe out for four. Then set your sights higher. Breathe in for eight. This is when you start to stumble. Bring in the breath retention. Know that you're tensing up and give yourself a break and relax. Breathe in more and then breathe out. Then that that six, pause, two, becomes eight. And then we do it again, getting up to 10. Then we do it again. Once you're doing a breath in for about 20 seconds, you're an expert. Then we start to breathe in and make the pause longer. And the pause is a relaxed pause, not gasping for air. So you've got a beautiful breath in, a beautiful elongated pause, a beautiful breath out, a beautiful elongated pause. You have breath mastery then. I think this is going to be really helpful. And the way you've explained it is so simple that people can sort of go back and listen just to these little bits again, just to just to get that guidance. The reason why I wanted you on the podcast is because I know how important breath work is for me and how, how that really does help me feel calmer and it makes me feel more balanced. And that is me a too. gift. It's a gift. And, and I wanted to share that. So can you... I mean, if, do you work online? How do you work with people if they wanted to speak to you further about any of what we've talked about? I'm on all of social media platforms. I love social media. So I'm on Instagram as Jane Nichols, Facebook as Jane Nichols. And that's um, with a Y. I, yeah, Jane with a Y and yeah. Nichols with a double L. I teach class now because of pandemic. All of my classes are online. So I can pick, pull people from all over the country. and. I teach all different kinds of things all the time. So I'll do pop-up workshops. So now I'm going to do, this month is dedicated to breathing. And it probably comes from the fact that I knew I was coming to you. I've been teaching myself um, how to tantric breathing and how to stimulate the chakras. And this is me turning into the person that I used to laugh at when I was a fitness pro. These are the things I never thought I would be doing. But I'm with my knowledge now, I'm teaching myself that. And I set up classes. So at five o'clock today, for example, everyone's going to come and give it a bash. All novices, and we're going to learn to use, they're called vandas. We use them in yoga, which is when you become in control of your breath, you can use abdominal locks 
to help you with your breath retention and you can breathe through the lock. It's mind-blowing. Um, so for four weeks, that's what we're going to mess about with. And so I, I, I've really learned because of pandemic to be in the moment with my teaching. So you're not coming along to the class that you go to at 10 a.m. every week because yeah. that's the time and you get, we're coming, we're going to do something new. And if you don't like it, you don't come back. And if you love it, you go out and you get better at it on your own. The whole responsibility is no longer me. Yeah. Oh, I love that. And yeah. It's good for, yeah, it's good for you. It keeps it all new and fresh for you and exciting. And Yeah, I'm so, it's liberated me in a way because I know that soon teaching class I can't run a business and teach class. It doesn't fulfill me financially, it only fulfills me spiritually. It's turned back into a hobby for me because it can never meet what the business can bring in. But doing it this way helps me to wean myself off teaching without grief. Mm. It's been such a big part of my life. I've been able to turn it into something else now that fulfills me, challenges me, and gives People who come to class a very different experience. So people are always welcome to come in. I can guarantee that I'll annoy you, confuse you, push you over a certain edge. But then you walk away having learned something. Brilliant. Brilliant. So I will make sure that all your social accounts and websites and everything are in the show notes. But I was just saying maybe just start up at Jay Nichols and Instagram and then people can kind of be navigated from there. Yeah, and if you Google me, I do come up because I've been around for such a long time. <laughs> oh, well, Jane, thank you so much. I've, I've genuinely really enjoyed this conversation. I think so many people will, will get a lot from it. So thank you so much. I hope so. So that's today's episode done. Did what we talk about resonate with you? I really hope you found some takeaways that may inspire you to make some small changes that enhance your daily life. And if you did find this episode insightful, please do consider sharing it. Knowledge and awareness is power, especially with ADHD. You can also head over to the show's Instagram page, which is ADHD Women's Wellbeing Pod, and join the community that's waiting for you there. And if this episode really did strike a chord, please do consider leaving us a review to enable more people who need to hear these conversations find the show. Thanks so much for joining me today and see you next time.